Today was a little bit of a yawn compared to the last time I was with you on Tuesday. The market was only up 0.12% today. And quite frankly, we were lucky to get that with more stocks down than up in the market today. But we did have a day where the Magnificent 7 outperformed with the exception of Tesla. Uh, so we'll take a look at that, see what it means for our posture. We do have four trade signals on all four of our major U.S. equity indices here in tonight's video that I'll explain. Uh, we'll also take a look at what's been going on from a macro perspective, take a look at oil prices plunging, uh, falling interest rates, the dollar in a weaker environment, and see what that does to uh, change our future expectations about foreign stocks and foreign bonds. We'll also look at the factor selector in tonight's video, see what's been going on with small caps in particular, and then we'll get into our trade application example where I wanted to feature a bear call spread on an industrial stock that has a bearish near-term posture and has had three straight long upper shadows on its candles. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Market Outlook video presented by MarketScholars.com. I'm your host, Brandon Van Zee. It's November 16th, 2023. First of all, if you're new, welcome aboard. Remember to go over to YouTube, click subscribe on our channel, then go down below into the description area. Make sure you're signed up for our email distribution list so that way you can be notified whenever we post these videos. We'll also give you a heads up as to which stocks are giving you overbought and oversold cluster signals at the bottom of those emails. In addition to that, we're heavy users of X, formerly known as Twitter. If you're not doing so already, I would encourage you to follow me at Brandon Van Z. We really appreciate the, those of you that click like and repost on this Market Outlook related content. And then last but not least, we do have a presence on Facebook. Feel free to join our group at that web address you see in the logo in front of you. All right, let's go ahead and jump into today's trade activity. And as you can see, we've got our S&P 500 heat map pulled up here in front of us. It's a bit of a mixed session here today, quite frankly. We seem to be kind of uh, just drifting for most of the day. It seems like uh, depending upon the hour that you looked at the market, uh, it might have been up or it might have been down. And uh, we pretty much finished flat when it was all said and done. So let's see what we can discover from the individual names here today. Maybe we'll get started here with the Magnificent Seven. Microsoft had a fantastic day. No surprise, all-time highs for uh, the, one of the world's largest companies at this point, right? Neck and neck there with Apple. So a, a very nice day from Microsoft, 1.76%. Uh, I've seen their CEO uh, being interviewed on CNBC here recently and meeting with some of the Chinese leadership and uh, out there uh, getting the Activision Blizzard deal done. Uh, so it seems like Microsoft is uh, definitely at the front and center here more recently, and uh, their shareholders have most definitely been rewarded as well. Apple uh, was up 0.9% today, so not bad. Uh, it did outperform the market, so we'll give them that, even though it wasn't a dramatic day. NVIDIA also outperformed the market. It was up 1.21%, not too shabby for uh, the largest semiconductor company. And then uh, over here towards our communications area, we had Google or Alphabet that was up 1.7%. Meta was up 0.45%. So both of those also outperformed uh, the market. Had a comment on Twitter here this afternoon. I had posted that Alibaba out of China had um, declared their very first dividend payment, which was a little bit of a surprise. I had not been hearing that name been floating around as a future dividend payer, but uh, there was a fellow that follows me there on Twitter that said, now I'm just waiting for Google to do the same thing. I said, I concur. Uh, I'd love to see Google at some point pay a dividend, but uh, so far, not quite yet. But uh, one day, I think that cash flowing machine uh, will be a steady dividend payer. Anyway, down here to the consumer discretionary area, and that's where we had a bit of underperformance here today within the Magnificent Seven. You can see Amazon was down 0.26% today. They were also in the news to a degree. Uh, I saw that they are now gonna be selling uh, cars on Amazon, if you can believe it. Hyundai, I believe, is the very first car manufacturer that will be working with them on that project. Of course, eBay, you can already buy used cars and things like this. This will be a little bit different, but um, you know, it just goes to show uh, under the right set of circumstances, folks will be willing to buy all kinds of things off of the internet. Remember when Amazon was first launched 20 some odd years ago, 
there was a fear that people would not want to pay for their books online uh, because they didn't know if they could trust uh, the banking system and digital transactions and all that kind of stuff. Uh, fast forward to where we're at here in 2023, people might be spending $50,000 buying a brand new car on Amazon, right? So it's kind of kind of interesting to see uh, that news story here today. And then uh, last but not least in the Magnificent Seven was Tesla. They struggled the most. They were down nearly 4% today. Uh, once again, Elon Musk, some controversial comments on Twitter and so on and so forth. So uh, anyway, uh, Tesla appears to be taking it, <coughs> excuse me, across the chin uh, on that here today as they were clearly the worst performing uh, Magnificent Seven company. But they certainly weren't alone being down here today. You can see that Cisco, the tech company, not the food distribution company, uh, was down nearly 10% today, 9.84% um, when it was all said and done. That's obviously a outsized down day for that somewhat uh, blue chip type of a company in the Dow Jones. Uh, they reported their earnings and apparently investors did not like what they heard. Speaking of which, take a look at Walmart, another Dow Jones company down 8% in this case off of their earnings announcement. Keep in mind, it was just, I think, yesterday uh, that Target came out with their earnings, and it was the exact opposite. Target was up like 17% at the end of the day, so kind of interesting to see the role reversal between those two here more recently. Remember, for most of 2023, it's been the opposite story. Walmart shares have done reasonably well. Targets have been taken to the woodshed, but here in the last 48 hours, it's been the exact opposite of that. Costco also had a struggle here today, down 3%. That bled on over to Dollar General, down 4%, and Dollar Tree also down 4%. So a tough day for the discount stores here today. Target was also down today, uh, but only 0.4%. And obviously after yesterday's 17% gain, uh, only giving back less than a half a percent on a tough day for their competitors would probably be viewed as a win for Target shareholders. Other big movers to the downside, you could probably uh, direct your attention over here to the energy area. Boy, that has fallen out of favor in a hurry. You'll recall that when I was with you in the video on Tuesday, we had looked at the uh, sector selector and I had mentioned how energy had fallen down to, I think it was the fifth place position. Remember, for much of the last several months, they've been number one. So recently, that has been unwound and in a big way. Um, a lot of it, remember, goes hand in hand with what's taking place with inflation expectations. And with that pulling back a little bit, um, I think it's putting some negative sentiment uh, in the oil patch as well. So a number of those once red hot oil companies really pulling back in a big way. I had mentioned here maybe a week or two ago uh, how my top down trend trading class had voted to kick Schlumberger or SLB Corp as they call it these days out of the portfolio. And thankfully we did. Um, when I brought that up last time, I think it was down like five and a half percent that day. Well, it was down another three percent today. So, you know, some of those oil companies that had looked like they were in significant uptrends earlier this year have started to break down. And when they start breaking down, they break down in a big way, right? I always uh, remind my top down trend trading class that the energy sector is akin to riding a bucking bronc. Uh, you're lucky if you can stay on it for uh, eight seconds or nine seconds or whatever. And uh, the reason is because a lot of the success of the sector is completely out side of the control of the management teams uh, that are the executives of those exact companies, right? Much of the sentiment around oil companies themselves is not based directly upon you know what product they sell the way that another manufacturing firm would be. Um, they're out of control out of their product that they sell, which is oil. And oil is set in the international commodity markets and the executives at Chevron and Exxon and Conoco and all those companies, uh, they don't have any control over the international oil prices. So they're just at the whims of the marketplace. Makes it a little bit more of a difficult situation for many of them. So oil and gas companies definitely struggling here today. Conoco down 2.6%, Chevron down another 2.6%. Remember, they were already at 52-week lows. But as most of you are aware, if you follow me on Twitter, uh, they still aren't trading in the blue zone of the dividend stair step chart. That's how in favor Chevron shares were here about a year ago after Russia-Ukraine outbreak. Um, they were so overvalued that even though they've been 
in a bit of a spiral downward here to new 52-week lows recently, they're still not trading in the blue zone of the dividend stair-step chart. Remember, that's really saying something because half of the 700 companies that I track on the dividend stair-step chart are in the blue zone. So it's a rare circumstance where a company is literally at 52-week lows yet still not joining the rest of the companies that had already been there. So just goes to show you the volatility both on the upside and the downside for a lot of those oil companies. Other areas that were out of favor today, I'd say some of the consumer discretionary names um, were out of favor. There's Best Buy down 3% today. Bed Bath and, or sorry, uh, not, not Bed Bath, but Bed and Body Works. I wanted to, to say the old company uh, Bed Bath and Beyond, but of course that company is no longer around. Uh, this one is, however, Bath and Body Works. Of course, you might find that when you're waltzing through uh, what feels to me like empty malls these days, uh, but uh, apparently shareholders agree because probably not a whole lot of foot traffic heading into Bath and Body Works recently if their share price is down 7% today. That was an ugly day. Ulta was down over 2%. Um, that's more of a standalone um, independent uh, store for makeup and other things like that, not necessarily directly associated with malls, but uh, I think they were kind of uh, collecting some of that shrapnel today uh, from those other areas as well. So that was an area out of favor. Down here, it looks like we've got quite a few out of favor as well. VF Corp down 3% today. Of course, that stock has been a house of pain for much of this year. Uh, Hasbro uh, down 3.6% here today. Uh, Tapestry down 2.5%. CarMax down over 5%. I have a feeling that is probably a direct result of the news that I had mentioned before about Amazon. Uh, I noticed that they were also interviewing uh, the inter or the uh, CEO from uh, Carvana on CNBC earlier today, and their shares were down a lot as well. Uh, and the speculation was because of the announcement of um, selling cars on Amazon moving forward. So those are some of your bigger losers here today. Let's go ahead and now talk about some of our bigger winners here today. McDonald's had a nice day, so, um, well, I won't exactly call it uh, cheap fast food anymore. Uh, it's all, always on a relative scale, right? And uh, even though fast food across the board has gone up, uh, McDonald's is probably still along the lower end of the scale as far as uh, somewhat cheaper food at convenience. Uh, and so I think there's probably going to be a place in our future with uh, McDonald's, uh, whether people want that or not. So McDonald's had a nice day up 2% today. Starbucks also had a nice day up over 1%. Starbucks is a company that we've covered a couple of times this semester in the dividend growth investing portfolio. And finally, it's getting its mojo back. Remember, a big part of the story is China for Starbucks and uh, with uh, President Xi and uh, President Biden uh, meeting up here uh, recently, I think out in San Francisco area, uh, there was maybe some enthusiasm that the um, relationship between China and the United States is maybe starting to thaw out a little bit there, and that probably helps support uh, a company like Starbucks a little bit more than it would otherwise. Some of the financials had a nice day. Uh, Berkshire, uh, once again, piling higher there, uh, of course, We've talked about uh, Warren Buffett quite a bit in my classes here in the last 48 hours. Many of you might have seen my post here the other night when they did uh, report their 13F. In fact, I think it was Tuesday night after I had report, uh, recorded this video. Uh, and I should also uh, uh, mention my faux pas uh, because uh, in the video, for some reason, I mentioned that the uh, trades were covering October. And after I got done recording the video, I kind of did a double take to myself and I thought, did I just say that? <laughs> because that is not the case. Uh, the trades would go through September, not October. So my apologies if that confused anybody there, but hopefully uh, you know what I meant uh, either way. So it was last quarter's uh, transactions that came out for Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway. So if you're looking for that information and you didn't catch it, uh, it is on my Twitter timeline there. Intel had a very nice day. That's a stock that's kind of you know back um, all of a sudden here as well. Some of you saw my tweet today about IBM and how a lot of people, um, you know, I, IBM is kind of like kryptonite, it feels like these days. Nobody wants to admit if they like it. Uh, and most people are more than happy to tell you that they would hate IBM. But the in, in, interesting thing to me is IBM hit a 52-week high today. In fact, it's not just a 52-week high, it's a five-year high. So people have hated on IBM perhaps 
uh, long enough to the point where anybody who was going to ever sell those shares uh, has officially done it. So while IBM did not have a big day today, up only a third of a percent, uh, that is high as that will take you all the way back to April of 2018. So uh, what's interesting about that is it seems to me to be quite quiet. Uh, I don't really hear anybody you know, talking about how well its share price is doing or anything like that. And of course, it's difficult for them because they're in the tech sector where you have absolutely monstrous gains out of companies like Apple and Microsoft. So I certainly understand that aspect of it. But you know, don't fall asleep on IBM. All of a sudden here, five-year highs and uh, uh, kind of uh, doing it in a sneaky way, I would say. A lot of the insurance stocks were back up today. Chubb, Progressive, Travelers, Allstate, they were all back on the upswing. Um, some of the healthcare companies uh, were making a move here today. Abbott Labs uh, was up. We had uh, Stryker up. We had uh, Dexcom up. Medtronic up. We actually just talked about Medtronic in our class on Tuesday. Uh, we had Intuitive Surgical up. And then while you won't see it here, I should give special mention to um, CRISPR therapeutics. Some of you will recall that we have a trade application example on CRISPR for this very video. Um, it was back in September when I put it on, September 12th. And as I said at that time, uh, it was the most speculative trade that I likely would be putting on uh, because it was a long haul trade on a uh, stock that would be going through FDA uh, announcements and other regulatory announcements in coming months. And uh, we were having to buy it at uh, some pretty high implied volatility. So there's always the chance that something like that will not go the way that the trader wants. But in this case, I'm happy to report that things have seemingly turned around for the trade. You can see we're up $480 on the trade now. Remember, we were down pretty significantly on that. Uh, if there's anything that I regret with the trade is my timing was way too early on it. I really wish I would have done this trade in October as opposed to September. Uh, then I would feel like uh, it's not quite as precarious. But uh, we'll see how it ends. Remember, this is a January contract, so we still have 64 more days. There's no guarantees I'll stay in it. If I do get out of it, remember, I will let all of you premium members know in our private Telegram channel. But I wanted to bring this one up today because today was a big day for science and the world in general. Some of you know that uh, while I am a dividend growth investor at heart, uh, there is one area uh, that I have uh, an interest in from a speculative standpoint, and that is uh, CRISPR-related uh, companies. And today was a historic day because, as you can see from the headlines here, the United Kingdom approved the first what they call genetic scissors treatment. That's kind of what they call the gene editing companies that use that Cas9. But uh, it is a big day. Um, you know, this is uh, Nobel Prize worthy uh, technology that is being implemented and has been in the laboratory for years at this point. And today, for the very first time, an important regulatory body has approved the world's first CRISPR treatment. And this first CRISPR treatment will be used on uh, sickle cell disease. Um, and that is the treatment that they are going for here in the United States as well. So CRISPR today was up about 5%, which is not tremendously dramatic. But remember, uh, it was just at 37 bucks here not too long ago, like maybe a month and a half ago. So from 37 up to 59. Um, I speculate that it's probably a little bit muted today because it was the United Kingdom. If this was the United States and it was only up 5% off of that news, I think this would have been viewed as a disappointing day. Uh, but the United Kingdom is a much smaller market for sickle cell disease than the United States is, and therefore uh, the stock had more of a, um, you know, uh, an okay day. I don't want to, you know, throw it under the bus or anything like that. We'll we'll all take a five percent day when we can get it. But um, it wasn't as dramatic as you might assume when you say something very dramatic like this is literally the world's first approved CRISPR treatment. And um, you know we've had to work awfully hard to get to this point as a society to prove out its safety. And there are going to be a number of possible 
um, ways to utilize this technology on other indications and diseases in the future if this goes well. So keep in mind that uh, I believe it is next month that the FDA will gather together and determine whether they will also approve this for sickle cell here in the United States. And I think right now the expectation is that they will approve it. If they don't, watch out below. I would have a feeling that this uh, stock would just get hammered big time to the downside if they do not approve it. Uh, on the other hand, if they do approve it, um, you know, this could be a billion dollar market. And keep in mind, CRISPR itself is a very small company. It's only a mid cap company. They're going to market with a much bigger company called Vertex Pharmaceuticals is kind of like their, uh, I guess you'd call them their sugar daddy. They're the ones that supplied the big money to, to, to have the research go along. Um, but they are partners in this venture for sure. So they each get a little piece of the action there. But, um, you know, CRISPR is obviously the much more direct way to play that hopeful uh, FDA approval here next month. Vertex, of course, is a much, much bigger biotech company that has a much more diverse pipeline. So the CRISPR portion of it is relatively small and therefore it wouldn't move the needle nearly as much. But for CRISPR therapeutics right here, hopefully, especially for our long call that we have going right now, uh, there's going to be a big opportunity with the FDA next month. So I will be uh, anxiously anticipating uh, what the verdict is from them. And I'll be sure to pass that along if I hear anything uh, on Twitter and elsewhere for those of you that follow me. All right, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at our breadth numbers here. You can see that the in the S&P 500, we had 227 stocks higher today. Um, and that is good for about 45% of the index closing in the green. Now keep in mind, uh, while we haven't looked at the chart yet, the S&P 500 was up about 0.12% today. So today was a day where the market was up, yet there were fewer stocks up than down within the market. And again, reason behind that is the heat map that we had looked at, especially the Magnificent Seven. When you have five out of the Magnificent Seven uh, outperforming, it has an ability to offset the weakness in the smaller um, sectors out there like energy or like you know some of the consumer discretionary areas that I had mentioned or what have you. So kind of an oddball day from that respect today where um, although the S&P 500 was up, you actually had more stocks down than up within it. That does happen on occasion and when it does, it's almost always a result of the Magnificent Seven outperforming and today was definitely one of those days. Let's go ahead and take a look at our charts now. And we've got chart 4B pulled up here in front of us. Remember, one of the benefits that you guys get when you become a three-year premium member of Market Scholars is the access to all 50 plus of the customized ThinkScript charts that we offer to our, our, our uh, clients. Uh, remember that the main feature of why somebody joins our organization is to gain access to the 10 uh, weekly classes that David and I teach, each with their own philosophies and strategies and trading plans and all that kind of stuff. So um, that's the main feature of our premium side of our business. But we also give you a lot of other perks like the aforementioned private Telegram channel to make you aware of any uh, trading decisions that we're making. Uh, and that's not just for these Market Outlook videos. That uh, was mostly set up for the actual um, trading rooms that we're teaching during the week. It's uh, The Market Outlook videos are kind of secondary to that. We do that there as well, but that wasn't actually the reason we started that. So, uh, But either way, if you're interested in either the Market Outlook videos and getting that information earlier than everybody else uh, who's watching the free video at night, or you just want to stay uh, plugged in to the trading decisions that David and I are making during the week on behalf of our uh, classes, uh, that's a really nice feature that is available for our premium members in addition to these 50 plus customized charts that you see here. So bring this up because next week, of course, is Black Friday. And if you've ever been interested in joining our services, uh, you might as well save a few bucks when you can do that. Uh, I think we usually uh, have a 20% off coupon that we will offer you. So keep that in the back of your mind as you're heading towards next week. And of course, we'll do our best to help you. You can always email us at support at marketscholars.com if you uh, need some additional information about that. All right, uh, let's go ahead and, and take a look at our analysis now. And you can see that the S&P 500 indeed was up 0.12%. So uh, pretty minor day, yet it does continue 
uh, what has been a remarkable stretch here ever since getting these oversold cluster signals we had this immediate reversion to the mean move and we basically went from three-month lows to pretty much three-month highs in one fell swoop that's how consistent that move off of those oversold clusters has been you had one red candle right there and remember that was the day that I was with you it might have been exactly a week ago when I was telling you that is the idealized form of the um, bullish intermediate confirmation signal where you have the green line in the upper reversal zone you have the red line in the lower reversal zone but not below five and the blue line between 20 and 50 and of course the very next day you were rewarded if you took action upon that particular signal now I bring that up because we actually got the signal again today however this is not the idealized form so that's why I spent as much time as I did here a week ago you know explaining that to you guys here so this one is not an idealized form because you can see that the blue line is not between 20 and 50 in, in fact it's not even out of the upper reversal zone yet so it's hard to get excited about a bullish intermediate confirmation signal that does not give you any sort of a legitimate pullback at least here you had a pretty sizable sell-off day what we had today was basically a flat day some of these other indices were down a bit more but um, I think you get the point like the, the the Russell 2000 would maybe be a good comparison to it the Russell was down 1.5 percent today now keep in mind it's still digesting its you know historic five and a half percent move higher here a couple of days ago so we can maybe give it a little bit of leeway in that regard but um, you'll notice that the Russell 2000 it also has a bullish intermediate confirmation signal today since its index was down one and a half percent that's a little bit more of a legitimate uh, give back there but even that is not enough to have this be the idealized form you have the blue line that is here above 50 right now it's at 57 and again we like to see that between 20 and 50 the um, the momentum line also um, you know prevents us from calling this the idealized form by the by the slimmest of margins it is below five so both of those things are not ideally what we want to see when we have this particular trade setup the way that we did see those things line up the way that we wanted to on this candle right here uh, back on November 9th but at least you could get away with saying this is a little bit more of a give back from the highs of yesterday to where we're at right now on the Russell 2000 the um, the, the, the S&P 500 I would have a hard time taking that signal seriously uh, when you're getting the signal on a day when it was technically up remember it's supposed to be the buy the dip signal uh, and you didn't even get any dip today let alone um, a legitimate one the Russell 2000 maybe you could kind of get behind that a little bit more but even there you've got some flies in the ointment um, you did get uh, bullish intermediate confirmation signals on the other two indices as well so here's what the Dow looks like green line in this case upper reversal zone uh, red line lower reversal zone but again similar to the S&P 500 notice the blue line is still in the upper reversal zone nowhere near that 20 to 50 zone the other thing I should mention because sometimes this gets a little confusing to some people um, the green line just has to be in a bullish position what I mean by that is the green line does not need to be in the upper reversal zone for that particular signal it just has to be considered bullish the red line does have to be in the lower reversal zone so they're they're a little bit different with how you would interpret those so in this case with the Russell 2000 that is still technically a bullish intermediate confirmation signal even though the green line is at 68 and rising if it was at 68 and falling then that would not be the case but because it's at 68 and rising we would consider that to be uh, a bullish intermediate confirmation signal with the Nasdaq same thing you've got the green line in the upper reversal zone you've got the red line in the lower reversal zone but again that blue line's not doing us any favors in this instance it's not between 20 and 50 it's way up there near 70 at the moment so we had bullish intermediate confirmation signals across the board today uh, the problem is none of them are the idealized form of that signal the way that we saw a week ago and therefore um, you probably can't trust them nearly as much um, as a result in terms of the movements of the other indices the Dow Jones was down 0.13 percent today it's probably a little bit of Cisco and a little bit of Walmart offsetting Apple and Microsoft there um, and then you had Nasdaq down or actually it was up 0.07 percent today so it was up but similar to the S&P 500 just barely you could call it flat 
The Russell 2000 was the only index that had any legitimate movement today. It was down 1.52%. You can see that all four of our charts do remain with a strongly bullish posture, right? The background colors of those charts are painted dark green, telling us that we have strongly bullish intermediate postures using the market forecast technical indicator. And then all four of the charts also have green 30-day moving averages. And what that means is that price remains above rising 30-day moving averages, which is also a bullish feature. So. You've got um, bullish postures across the board. You got price above rising moving averages across the board. That's a pretty good place to be, right? Uh, if you want to be bullish in the markets, um, it's more helpful than the opposite. Uh, of course, the question is always, have we gone too far too fast, right? And that's a more legitimate question because this has been a very aggressive move off of the bottom, and we're kind of stalling out a little bit as it seems here on the S&P 500 for the moment. Of course, tomorrow brings new information, but right now kind of gives you the impression there's a little stalling out. Again, it's hard to really get behind that notion if the market was technically up today, but it didn't continue to advance at a really aggressive pace the way that we had seen in prior, prior days of this big move that we've had. And so if this does tend to be a topping out type of a formation right here, um, the positioning of it is not great because it would mean that we would be stalling out just shy of hitting that multi-month high from back here on September 1st. So we'll keep our eye on that. Um, tomorrow is a big day. Remember, tomorrow is options expiration day. Sometimes that comes with additional volatility depending upon how market makers are positioned. We're in pretty good shape with the trades that we have on. Uh, there is one that I need to keep my eye on uh, tomorrow, and that's Abbott Labs. Remember, we had done a bear call spread on that. Uh, and it, for the entirety of the trade, it looked like it was in good shape. But with this massive rally uh, that we've had in the market here in the last couple of weeks, uh, that one is borderline. It's not in the money right now, but I think our, our short strike was 99. And so uh, I'm going to have to babysit that position perhaps tomorrow. Remember, if I do close that down, I'll let you guys know in our Telegram trade alert uh, channel for those of you that are premium members. But that's one that I have to babysit. I, I'm pretty sure the other positions that we have expiration days on uh, for tomorrow are good to go. Remember, we have a whole bunch of sold put trades. Uh, some people forget how quickly the sentiment has changed in the market. Remember, it was only like two months ago uh, that I was regularly doing these videos on days when the market was down over 1% and we were selling puts on stocks like Target. Remember, Target was actually one of the companies we sold puts on, so we were uh, enthusiastic supporters of yesterday's uh, massive 17% rally out of Target, but there were others like T. Rowe Price and some of those uh, as well. Honeywell, I think, was one. So um, all of those should roll off of our books at max gain tomorrow, which will be nice as well. All right, uh, let's go ahead and pop on over here to the internet now that we're at the halfway mark. I always like to get a chance to say thank you to those of you that help support these presentations. Remember, we do these on a volunteer basis. They are not required. We don't get paid to do them. Uh, we have to ask ourselves every single day if it's our, worth our time to do these videos. And these videos, believe it or not, take um, about three hours, it depends. If I'm doing the shorter form of the version, it wouldn't take quite as long. But in general, these longer form videos that I do, while the part that you see is only an hour, it takes me two additional hours beyond that to produce the video and to send out the notifications and the emails and do the editing and the uploading and all that kind of stuff that goes into it. You guys don't see the half of it. So if you appreciate the effort uh, that I make when uh, I do decide to do the video, I ask one simple request that should not be difficult for any of you that do want to help us. Uh, you can make up excuses if you want, and uh, you know maybe they will be even be good excuses. But in the end, every single person who's watching this video right now has access to the internet, and therefore everybody who has access to the internet has access to Twitter, uh, which is a free service. It's just a matter of whether you want to uh, go that extra step there for us and help us along or not. What I would say is this was a very unique um, video where we got exactly 100. <laughs> so um, when I say every vote counts, I mean it. Uh, it. There's 100 people that clicked like for me since Tuesday. If any one of you would have chose to not take the five seconds out of your day, I wouldn't even be talking right now because the video would have already been done uh, 15 minutes ago. So in this case, boy, you, you know how to cut it close, right? No leeway whatsoever. Every single person that clicked like 
uh, is the reason I am still talking right now in this hour-long video. So um, keep it up. I, I appreciate those hundred of you. Uh, appreciate the rest of you as well. Uh, but again, need to stress that David and I each day have to really ask ourselves, is it worth our time to do these videos? And the way that you guys let us know that it's worth our time is not necessarily telling us, it's just simply clicking a free button and that will let us know that you want us to continue doing these. So I'll make the same deal for you next time around. By the time I'm scheduled to do the video on Tuesday, I'll plan on doing another full length video for you uh, as long as we're up and over 100 likes or in this case, even at 100 is good enough for me. Um, just getting into the triple digits there. So let's do some shout outs. Uh, thank you to Teddy, thank you to T-Fib, thank you to Ash, thank you to Ann, thank you to Nina, and Fred, and Ron, and Keola, and Venki, and Jayesh, and Serene, and Karen, and Dennis, and Sandeep, and Nick, and Randy, and BZ Japan, and Ray, and Doug, and Ryan, John, Judy, Charles, Leah, Greg, Fathy, Curdy, Scott, Linda, Rich, Ken, Joel, David, Michael, Paul, Roger, Teresa, Jim, Jim, the, 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 they go on and on and on and on. I can't get to all 100 of you, but I, my hope is that you hear your name rattled off every so often just so that you know that I am recognizing you because I think sometimes people wonder, well, they, do they even know if I'm clicking like, yep, David and I see every single like that comes through. That's what this little notifications button is over here. So uh, we certainly see you, we recognize you, we appreciate you. And if you appreciate us, we would ask simply that you continue that type of behavior. It goes a long way for a very small business like ours that is trying to get the word out about our business uh, and do it in a cost-effective way like through social media. All right, uh, let's come on over here to the factor selector now and see what we can learn from this graphic. Remember, this is actually put together on Tuesday nights, and so it is two days stale at this point. Remember, our premium members have immediate access to it, but here on these free videos, uh, we have a little bit of a delay for obvious reasons, and um, still gives us a pretty good sense as to what's taking place from a factor perspective. So let's see what we can learn. First of all, momentum remains at the top from a factor perspective. It's not entirely surprising. What's been interesting, there's been a bit more of a tug of war, I would say, from a momentum perspective here recently. At least that's how I'm seeing it. Keep in mind, I come at it from a different approach than perhaps some of you, but I teach a top-down trend trading class every Monday morning, and that is effectively a momentum class. And I've noticed um, some strangeness out of the portfolio lately. We've had a really good run of things in recent months, but in recent days, it's kind of been back and forth depending upon circumstances. And it, it feels like there's a fight taking place underneath the market that not everybody is seeing right now. And it kind of feels like it's a fight between what was once working versus what was not working and whether um, you know that tug of war can go one direction or another. Like earlier in this video, even I made that comment about Walmart and Target just being a good example there. But that's happening at more of a theme or style perspective, I've noticed as well. Another good example of that would be energy. Remember, energy was doing tremendously well from a sector perspective uh, week after week for months. And now all of a sudden, it feels like it has completely unwound. Um, so I'm not sure how good of a position momentum is here in that number one slot. It feels to me like it's a little bit more precarious than uh, may be thought of otherwise. Remember, normally you think of momentum as doing quite well when there is a risk on mindset for the stock market. Typically, when markets are more bullish, it is more of a risk on mindset, right? Money gets pulled out of the bond markets or other areas and put into the stock market and prices get chased. That's kind of the momentum concept in a nutshell. So we're definitely in that type of a vibe of the stock market, but it seems like who is leading um, gives us a little bit more of a, an open question you know, as to where do we go from here. It seems like there's some transitions and some pivots taking place underneath the surface. Another good example of that was what I had mentioned on Tuesday when we had that massive breakout day in the market. Well, the superstar that day was the Russell 2000. And who was the area that was most out of favor recently? It was the Russell 2000. So that's another example of 
there seems to be a tug of war underneath the surface. And I'm not sure how that is going to impact momentum because remember, momentum is not getting um, updated every single day. The, the way that most of the momentum ETFs work is they have um, you know a, a, a portfolio turnover um, schedule uh, known in advance. Like one of the more popular momentum funds, they only update their portfolio twice a year. I think it's in November and then in May. So it really depends upon what was working immediately be before those two time periods to see where the portfolio gets transitioned to. So if you have these moments along the way where there's a tug of war, uh, it might not always shake out to those specific areas that had gathered that momentum previous to the um, portfolio rebalancing dates. So um, we'll see how that, that works moving forward, but just wanted to share my thoughts on that topic because I kind of get the sense that momentum is doing well on the surface, but it's not quite as robust as what you might think otherwise in this type of a market environment. Quality is back up to number two. Remember, that is driven a a lot by the Magnificent Seven companies, and uh, they've done okay, right? There's been a little bit more back and forth on that concept as well, but it's not as though that has completely fallen apart, right? Energy has kind of completely fallen apart, uh, but there are no energy stocks in the Magnificent Seven. So Magnificent Seven has had days of underperformance versus days of outperformance where it hasn't been quite as clear there either, but it just hasn't been as vicious of a drop as what you're seeing in some of the other areas. So they're hanging up there reasonably well. Of course, a stock like Microsoft hitting all-time highs uh, very much helps the quality factor. Remember, Microsoft is one of just three companies um, that have AAA balance sheets and credit ratings according to the credit rating agencies here in the United States. So Microsoft is one of the key holdings of most of the quality funds that are out there. So if Microsoft is hitting all-time highs, that's really going to have a big impact on quality. On the downside, you will see we did have a switcheroo in the 5-6 position last week, and that is low size going up, dividend yield going down. I think this is more of a story of immense outperformance of low size as much as it is dividend yield underperforming. In other words, because these um, rankings included Tuesday's massive 5.5% surge out of the Russell 2000, that is going to have a huge impact on the low size factor. Remember what I'd mentioned to you there on Tuesday, that that was literally the second best day in four years for the small caps. So this is not some sort of a a non-event, nothing burger, throwaway type of a day. That was a monumental day right there, and that has the ability to impact the entire factor itself. So obviously we're still in second to last place, so it's not like it rocketed it all the way up to the, the top or anything like that, but it's a start. So we'll see where it takes us from here. So I don't really think it was a, a story of dividends doing poorly here last week. I think it was more of a story that on a relative basis, the small caps just were roaring on Tuesday, and that's really starting to show up here in the uh, rankings. All right, let's get back on over here to the Thinkorswim platform now and do some 12 grid analysis. And we'll start off with chart 5A. <coughs> this will be the market cap 12 grid. I'm not market cap, sorry, asset class 12 grid. Um, and so this is going to show us different financial markets out there, not just stock related content. So let's get started in the lower two corners like we've been wont to do for much of the last couple of years because it feels like this market is being driven by whatever is happening in those bottom two corners. Starting with the 10-year treasury yield, once again, we had falling interest rates here today. Uh, we're down to 4.44%, which is exactly where we closed two days ago. So yesterday they were back up a little bit. Today we went right back to the closing prices of where we were on Tuesday when we had that massive, massive day. Remember we talked about how the size of that candle and how it was bigger than everything else on the board. Yesterday you had a little bit of a dead cat bounce, but gave it all right back here today. So that's probably a little bit more of a promising sign. It, it means that the um, participants within the market are serious that they believe that there's going to be rate cuts next year. I don't know if I believe that yet, but that's what the market believes at this point. Uh, and that's why we see the price activity that we do. So 10-year uh, treasury yield down to 4.44%. Obviously, that means we stay with the strongly bearish posture on it. 
and it is down below a falling 30-day moving average. Remember, all else being equal, that's a positive thing for the stock market, especially those companies that are heavily leveraged, especially the utilities and the REITs. Remember when I did the trade application example with you guys on Tuesday, what I selected was Con Ed. I was talking about the Ghostbusters uh, and Con Ed being the big utility company in New York City. And uh, that trade's done pretty well for the last couple of days. I was a little hesitant on it because it's not generally my style to get in on a trade after it makes a big move. I was a little bit more willing to do that with Con Ed because, of course, you know, the weeks and months leading up to that. But even there, it felt a little uncomfortable. It's just generally not my style to do it. But I, at this point, I'm glad that I did because the utilities have continued to work the last couple of days reasonably well, at least compared to other areas within the market. Of course, that could change tomorrow for all I know, but so far, so good. So remember, when interest rates fall, it generally supports utilities and REITs, all else being equal. There can still be individual news stories that will negatively impact them or what have you, but if there are no other stories out there and you know they're just reacting to rates, it's a good thing for utilities and REITs when interest rates do start falling, and that's what we've seen more often than not in the last three weeks. Remember that also positively benefits bond prices, so no surprise, um, foreign bonds actually broke out to three month highs here today. You can see here on the foreign bond chart, we are now above this candle from August 31st. So that's really saying something, right? It was just a couple of weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, that foreign bonds were literally at three month lows, just like that, a straight shot higher to three month highs as a result of interest rates rolling over. High yield bonds also were up today. They were up 0.13%, so not quite as much as the foreign bonds 0.39%, but still a decent day, especially considering oil prices getting um, hit hard here today. Remember, there is a little bit of correlation between high yield bonds and oil prices because it's a lot of the junkier oil companies that raised high yield debt. So um, despite the fact that oil prices were down huge today, high yield bonds still managed to close higher courtesy of falling rates. And then um, the long-term U.S. Treasuries also had a pretty decent day, up 1.24%. And you can see that all three of those bond categories continue to have strongly bullish intermediate postures. All three of them are above their rising 30-day moving averages. You'll notice down in the lower left-hand corner now uh, that the US dollar managed to close higher today, so it didn't really um, work in conjunction with falling rates the way that it did on Tuesday. Remember, on Tuesday, I was uh, singing the praises of not only a plunging 10-year uh, U.S. Treasury yield, but also a plunging U.S. dollar. Today, we didn't get the, the one-two punch there because the dollar was up, but still not, very, not, not by very much, right? It was only up 0.07%. Um, the dollar was down significantly on Tuesday. In fact, I think I followed it up with a tweet um, showing you just how rare this was. This was actually the worst day in an entire year for the U.S. dollar. That's how bad that was on on uh, on Tuesday. I was trying to make the point in the video that it didn't sound like it was down a lot because I think it was only down like 1.58% or something like that. But I was trying to make the point that that is actually a massive move in the currency markets. Um, and so I went to look that information up after I got done recording it just because I was curious for myself. And indeed, that was the worst day for the US dollar in an entire year. So um, remember, that provides a nice headwind for stocks when that occurs as well. Today, we didn't, not a headwind, but a wind in the sails is a better way to, to phrase that, I guess, uh, for most stocks. Not all, uh, because some stocks actually do want a strong dollar. But what I would say is the stocks that I'm interested in uh, are the ones that have international exposure. And therefore, um, a falling dollar is something that I am actually encouraged by, uh, not the opposite. But the last two days, you've had uh, the U.S. dollar um, stabilize. Now, these have both been up days, but let's not take that too far. This is basically a nothing burger, right? This is only up 0.07%. That's basically an afterthought. So um, the, I think the real story here is that we plunged on Tuesday in the dollar and we have not reverted to the mean after that. We've just held the line. So I think all else being equal, that's bearish for the dollar and bullish for stocks. You can see the US dollar, <coughs> once again, uh, has a strongly bearish posture. It is trading below its falling 30-day moving average. You can see that one of the beneficiaries of a weak dollar environment has been gold. Um, 
you know, we talked about that bounce here the other day and following up a couple days later, nothing has necessarily changed in that regard. Um, the posture has gone to strongly bullish, so I think that has changed, but um, the point is the bounce continues to look b robust. This is a nice looking chart here for gold. It's interesting how different the chart for gold is compared to oil, right? Sometimes those two work hand in hand, sometimes they don't. They do have different dynamics that affect their pricing. But gold um, is oftentimes more pushed around by whatever's happening with the dollar. When the dollar is weak, gold can get strong. When the dollar is strong, gold can get weak. So there's kind of an inverse relationship there and that um, has largely been playing out here more recently. So I really like the bounce out of gold here lately, up and off of that rising moving average, strongly bullish posture. Oil looks like the house of pain. Um, oil is at three month lows. In fact, it's so bad for oil, we have yet another oversold cluster signal. So could we be in, in store for some sort of a quick little snapback type of a rally? Sure, but it's gonna have to prove it to us if it wants to um, kind of make the point that it wants to go into a bullish trend again. Um, you have to be careful trusting those too much um, because a lot of times you're gonna find that they're gonna go up to that moving average and then they're gonna roll over again. So right now, that is helpful. I had mentioned maybe a week ago in this video that of all of these charts that we're looking at here on this 12 grid, if we can get the bottom two corners along with oil to be dark red backgrounds, those are good things for the stock market, right? And that's exactly what we have right now. We have falling interest rates, which is supportive of those highly leveraged individual stocks out there. We have falling oil prices, which is basically good for pretty much all of the other sectors except for oil, because remember most other sectors have transportation costs and manufacturing costs where they use oil. And if oil prices are high, it pinches margins. So we have falling oil prices and we have a falling dollar. And here in the United States where we're blessed with as many um, multinational companies like McDonald's and Coca-Cola and all those types of companies, that's a good thing when the dollar is weak. So we kind of have the trifecta right now, at least from my perspective as a dividend growth investor, of what you want to see. I want to see a weak dollar. I want to see falling oil prices. I want to see falling interest rates. And that's what we have going for us. So no surprise that this is all happening in an environment where the stock market is going straight up, right? Uh, that's what we've witnessed here in the last three weeks. And it doesn't uh, you know, just stop with the U.S. markets. The foreign markets look strong as well. Now, they were down a little bit today. Again, the dollar was up, and a lot of times when the dollar is up, foreign stocks are down, and that did happen today. But the key is, from an intermediate perspective, this is feeling like a much, much better story here all of a sudden than it did just a couple of weeks ago. Right Back then, we were stuck below this falling moving average. Now we're clearly above the rising moving average and we have lots of room to spare. So we've got room to work with. Even if we have a few sell-off days here and there, it shouldn't automatically make you assume that the, that the rally is failing. So um, we're in a really nice position, not just here in the United States, but also from a foreign stock market perspective here at the moment. Um, EEM and EFA both have strongly bullish postures and above rising moving averages the same way that the S&P 500 does. Bitcoin was up a bit today, but kind of, again, tug of war there. The key is that it's held the gains from this monumental week that it had here a couple of weeks ago. It hasn't really progressed from there, but then again, it hasn't really deteriorated. So we're kind of in no man's land here, but it definitely tilts more bullishly because we're holding those gains. Let's go ahead and now take a look here at our sectors today. This will be chart 5C. And as we pull this up, not a huge surprise that we have just one pink chart on the board. And guess which one that is? It's the one that is most closely affected by what I just said a moment ago. When oil prices are falling, it's usually beneficial to all other sectors except one. And of course, the one sector is energy because naturally when your uh, energy sector is chocked full of companies like Conoco and you know e EOG Resources and Chevron and Exxon and those types of companies that pull oil out of the ground, they wanna see oil go up, uh, but they're usually alone in that uh, regard. Most other companies out there benefit when oil prices come in because their profit margins expand. So this is kind of a unique view uh, of the markets for this year because we really haven't seen this where it's 
energy that's really out of favor to the point of having a weakly, or I'm sorry, a strongly bearish posture in this case, and all other sectors have strongly bullish postures. If anything, uh, it would have been more common to see the exact opposite uh, in earlier parts of this year. So my oh my, how things have changed and they've done so in a hurry. Uh, do keep in mind, this is the market cap weighted ETFs and that does have an impact. But in general, I think it is telling the, the legitimate story of this market right now. Um, things are a lot better in the stock market and uh, part of that as courtesy of falling oil prices. So energy, no surprise. Uh, it was our worst performing sector here today, down 1.95% and bouncing down and away from that falling 30-day moving average yet again. So price is still below a falling moving average and we still have a strongly bearish posture. All other uh, sectors have a strongly bullish posture and of those, we have a number of them trading above their rising 30-day moving averages. In fact, the only one that's not is healthcare. Healthcare is above its moving average, but the moving average is still falling. So that's why it's colored yellow there. But if you look at the uh, tips of the moving averages on all the rest of the charts, they're all green. So that's a positive sign there as well, supportive of bullish price act activity. In terms of separating those winners even further, uh, I would probably say that technology, communications, and financials are the areas that look the most appealing from a market cap weighted perspective. Remember on an equal weighted perspective, there might be some slight differences there, but on these particular charts that we're looking at right now, technology is up here at new three month highs, communications is up here at th new three month highs, and financials is just a stone's throw away. You can see right here where we're at on the financials, but back here we were slightly higher on September 14th. But if we have a big bullish day in the market tomorrow, I don't know if we will, but if, if we do, um, that that is close enough where that could be taken out as soon as tomorrow. So in other words, um, you know, this is something that is looking more likely than not to be broken out of to the upside um, in the coming um, days or weeks for the financials. So, you know, that's what you want to see. Remember, the financials in a lot of ways are the lifeblood of the market. Um, so to have that kind of more cyclical area joining forces with the compounders in the technology and communications area, I think is a, a pretty good thing for the market's prospects, all else being equal as well. Um, in terms of which sector was the best today, it was actually utilities, uh, up 0.53%. A lot of them were in that, that range. For instance, technology was up 0.5%, but by the slimmest of margins, utilities was up 0.53%. And so again, going back to what I had mentioned before, that has been supportive of this trade that I did with you guys on Tuesday. Con Ed has gone up each of the last couple of days, so it's working to our benefit. So even after reacting to that, after the massive up move in utilities on Tuesday, uh, they have continued to be supportive of that because interest rates have continued to uh, languish. So uh, we'll see if that continues, but um, right now we like what we see out of it. All right, let's get into our new trade application example for tonight's video now. And as a reminder, the trade is already done. The trade gets done while the market is open. So while most of you who watch this free video on YouTube will not find out about it until at night after the market is closed, those of you who are premium members of Market Scholars will already know what the trade is and give you time to consider it and react if you want to. Uh, I never want to give the impression that you should be taking the exact trades that I'm presenting. That's why we call them examples uh, and application examples of that. Uh, they, we are not your advisor and all that kind of good stuff from a disclosures perspective, but um, it at least gives you an informational edge that you can use to consider uh, if you so desire. So today's trade, let me come on over here and pull up chart 3A. Today's trade was actually a bearish trade, and this is on Rockwell Automation, ticker symbol ROK. So I wanted to do something a, a little bit bearish here today, um, not necessarily because I think the markets themselves are bearish, but you guys have heard me mention in the past that I do try to keep some sort of balance in the portfolio. And we've been doing more bullish trades like the aforementioned Con Ed here uh, recently. So figured I'd take this opportunity um, to do a bearish trade in this case on Rockwell Automation. So let's kind of talk it through here uh, what I ended up doing. So first of all, I sold the bear call spread. 
Now I got an email about this and remember you don't buy bear call spread so there should be no confusion around that but just so I'm clear on it we sold the bear call spread you can buy a, a, a bull call spread as a debit spread but if you're doing a uh, credit spread the way that we teach you especially with out of the money strikes you can't buy a bear call spread unless you're flattening your previous position or something like that you sell them that's what creates the credit and that is what I'm doing in this case as well so when you're selling a bear call spread it is a multi strike strategy where you are selling a call strike that is closer to the current price and at the same time you're buying a call strike that is further away from the current price and when you do something like that you create a credit because the call strike that's closer to the current price is going to have more premium associated with it than the one that you're buying that's further away so that's what creates that credit up front in this case I did the um, the December 280 by 290 bear call spread so I sold the 280 and you can see I've got this um, black line drawn on the chart here but it doesn't say 280 it says 280 250 and the reason it says that number is because I got two dollars and fifty cents for selling that spread remember we usually target the 30 percent return on risk area so if you've um, you've seen David and I do that with our, our, our credit spreads in the past it's not just um, you know a random coincidence or anything like that we we generally target that area that 30 percent area that carries over from what we used to teach you guys when we worked for, for TD Ameritrade all those years so anyway that was the one that was available there um, keep in mind this is a higher price company so I didn't have nearly as many um, strike prices to work with in addition to that we have a very low volatility environment right now the victim is at uh, 14 so that didn't necessarily do me any favors here either but remember that is oftentimes the case when you're selling bear call spreads that you have to put up with a lower VIX because you're doing them on a in a situation where there's been a reversion to the mean move and when there's a reversion higher it typically means that the VIX is going to be falling so this is a challenge I regularly have to put up with and there's not a whole lot of good ways around that obviously it'd be the opposite if you were selling call spreads after a major breakdown in the market but I'm not quite as bold to do something like that because I don't want to be chasing the market around I'd rather position myself before an expected move so um, in this particular case I sold the 280 I bought the 290 I got a credit of two dollars and fifty cents so my break-even is 280 250 and what that means is I want this stock to stay below this break-even of 28250 between now and the December expiration which is basically a month from right now so in the next month I'm hoping that this stock stays below this black line and if it does then I will have a decent chance of making money on this trade if it doesn't and it goes higher then I do have defined risk on the trade that's another nice thing about selling credit spreads the way that we do is that you know what your worst case scenario is when you're doing that in this case my worst case scenario is losing 750 bucks my best case scenario is, is making 250 bucks um, why those numbers are different from one another is I'm setting the odds in my favor to begin with right I'm starting with a price at 272 right now and I'm basically giving myself a ten dollar per share head start but you don't get that for free that is made up for in the the risk rate uh, reward ratio and and the odds of success of the trade and all that kind of stuff um, the reason that I selected this one here today of all of the different companies I could have gone with is because you can see that we have reverted back to a bearish posture from a, from a near-term perspective, right? This chart 3A is the chart that I use in my Wednesday morning factor-based swing trading class where we're only planning on being in the trade for weeks and this one is on the shorter end of the curve from a credit spread perspective, right? I'm not going out two months here, I'm only going out one month and so um, you know you're looking at four weeks in this case and you can see that the blue line has fallen out of the upper reversal zone and started pointing lower here that actually started yesterday um, but I just caught it here today of course I didn't teach this video yesterday so it wouldn't have mattered anyway um, but what has also been catching my eye in the last three candles is that we have these long upper shadows that are associated with them remember long upper shadows in and of themselves are not necessarily bearish but they are telling you something about the trading activity on an intraday basis that is intriguing and that is that while the market has had every opportunity to close this particular company at the highs of the session it chose instead not to 
Instead, it sold it off on an intraday basis to a much lower level. Now, those three candles were still three bullish candles. In other words, they climbed close over close over close. Um, right, The closing price is what you will see in the Wall Street Journal when you wake up and look at it the next day. But what the Wall Street Journal is not telling you necessarily is the shape of the candles. You can maybe envision it if they also are giving you a high and low uh, information within the newspaper, but obviously that's the benefit of looking at charts. We can actually visualize that process taking place where there is an advancement or a supposed advancement uh, of the share price, but internally on each day basis, you're actually seeing the bears step in. On a day like a couple of days ago, that was especially intriguing because that was the day when you had that massive breakout across the market, yet this one did not close near the highs of its uh, range that it carved out that day. Of course, that did include a, a gap, so that needs to be taken into consideration as well. But the point is, you know, you have some evidence on the chart um, with the bearish pink background color there for the near-term posture combined with some long upper shadows and in a market where we just had an explosive upside move, um, it's getting harder and harder to finding the bearish trades. This is one that maybe you could get away with if you're trying to look for balancing out things within your portfolio to have some bearish trades matched up with some of the, the bullish ones that have been working already. Okay, So that's what I have for you here today. Hope you enjoyed the presentation. Again, if you did, uh, there is one easy way to let us know that you appreciated the effort, and that is simply to click like for us on our tweet. And there's four different ways that you can find that tweet in question. You can go over to my timeline uh, on Twitter, and it'll be pinned to the top of my timeline to make it nice and easy for you to find and click like on. Otherwise, if you're watching this video right now on the Market Scholars website, we have that little Twitter widget directly below the video, so you can click like while you're watching the video. If you're watching this video directly on YouTube, you can click on the description area of the YouTube video and you'll see the tweet in question listed there as well. And then last but not least, within the emails that many of you receive, uh, there is a Twitter icon, or it may say X these days, but you'll get the gist. Uh, and if you click that icon, it will then take you over to the tweet in question. So whichever one of those four approaches is easiest for you, that's the one that I would encourage you to implement. Then again, some of you might not really like all this additional analysis. Maybe you do prefer the 15 minute versions of the videos because you've got plenty of other content to sink your teeth into, and that's perfectly fine as well. Certainly don't wanna be wasting your time. So if that's the case, then don't click like, uh, and I can uh, keep it under 15 minutes uh, if we are under 100 likes on Tuesday. So I'll let you guys decide collectively. Uh, whatever you do decide, I appreciate you guys checking out tonight's video. Uh, I'm sure David uh, will be back with you here tomorrow or this weekend at some point. So it'd be good to hear his views. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy uh, your football games this weekend. My Rams were on a bye last week, but we're we're going up against an in-division uh, rival there with the Seahawks. So uh, good luck to all of your teams as well. And then we got the big uh, Formula One race in Vegas. Uh, I'm not a big uh, race car guy, but I think even I want to check that out just to see how those race cars are zooming through all of those casinos on the strip. So uh, kind of an interesting gawker, I guess I will be this weekend. But uh, hope you all enjoy your weekend, whatever you find yourself doing. And I'll look forward to seeing all of you early next week. Best of success with your trades and your investments. Goodbye for now.